Hello and welcome. This is Push Square Deep Dive, a brand new series for the channel where we take an in-depth look at some of your favourite PlayStation franchises. That means you can expect to see character analysis, scene breakdowns and explorations of world lore for series like Ghost of Tsushima, God of War and Horizon. But today's episode is all about the post-apocalyptic world of The Last of Us. This instant classic from Naughty Dog exceeded the expectations many had for the then tired zombie apocalypse genre. And it did so by delivering something sombre and mature, but more importantly, something that had a considerably deep lore filling in the gaps of its world. And that's what we are here to talk about today. With the impending release of the PS5 remake just around the corner, I thought I would take this opportunity to dig into the world that plays home to some of the most unforgettable stories. Now of course we can't cover everything here today and that may come in future episodes, but for this video we're discussing the first 20 years of the apocalypse. That's the gap between the prologue in 2013 and the main game in 2033. We're going to be answering questions like, how did the virus grip America so quickly? How did society fall? And what was Joel up to during those years? We'll be looking at both part 1 and 2 for this, so expect some mild spoilers for part 1 and light spoilers for part 2. With that being said, my name is Aaron Bain and let's immerse ourselves in the world of runners, clickers and bloaters in our first Push Square Deep Dive. Before we get to the post-apocalypse, we have to learn how the apocalypse itself came to be. The fall of man had very small beginnings. The Cordyceps brain infection, or CBI, is a very real virus in our world, typically only infecting insects. However, here, the virus makes the jump to humans. But how did we move from ants to people? For this part of the story, we need not look further back than September 26, 2013 which unbeknownst to many, would be the last normal day on Earth, Outbreak Day. Joel's daughter Sarah awakens in the early hours of September 27th, and a newspaper she can find in the bathroom informs us that a fungal mould was found in tainted crops from South America, and these crops had made their way into the general food supply across America. Well, the FDA carried out an investigation and many food companies had already withdrawn their products, it was all too little, too late, as the fungal cordyceps infection began to tear its way through the human population. Through the campaign, we discovered that there are four initial stages of the cordyceps infection and two ways to become infected. Runner, stalker, clicker and bloater are the four base stages, with the cordyceps fungus gradually consuming the body, bursting and sprouting from the brain. The Last of Us Part 2 introduced Shamblers and the Rat King, and while the latter was an exceptional example, we know it wasn't uncommon for the infected to conjoin. The primary stages of Runner, Stalker and Clicker were said to take place within a year or so of the initial infection, while Bloaters took over a decade to form. And from this we can only surmise that more stages were yet to arise as the years rolled on and the fungus found new ways to mutate the human body. Between these different stages, the infection was spread via either bite or the inhalation of spores. Spores emanated from a body once CBI killed its host, leaving it as a sprouting ground for fungal growth. Before death, the host would typically find a small and enclosed spot to release its spores. These areas were deadly, but a functioning gas mask would protect anyone within them. However, one crack or leak and it was game over. The initial infection spread through 60% of the world's population, with those included either being infected or dead. The number of fatalities and infection only grew as time went on, and any desperate attempt to find a cure failed. So all of that was the initial stages of the apocalypse, the how of the virus and its spread, but what about the fall of society? What happened to the world as we know it between 2013 and 2033? Well a lot of those 20 years are actually tied up in the success and failure of quarantine zones, areas which were established to shield non-infected individuals from the spread of CBI. 
From the title sequence, we learn that residents were called to register with corresponding QZs. Amidst the chaos, any semblance of government was overthrown, leaving a branch of the American military in charge of these zones. This force was called FEDRA, the Federal Disaster Response Agency. FEDRA ruled its QZs with an iron fist, rooting out any infected and enforcing strict curfews. Residents were also drafted into FEDRA with threat of a reduction in rations or possibly even the loss of residency if they failed to comply. The Boston QZ, where Joel Miller resides at the beginning of his and Ellie's story, was an incredibly well-guarded zone with giant perimeter walls and a huge military presence. However, Boston was more of the exception rather than the rule. We learn in Billstown that some cities and towns got the heads up on the pandemic and were able to establish quarantine zones ahead of time. Mandatory evacuation. Evacuate to where? Where do you think? Quarantine zone. See, some places got a heads up before the infection showed up. Most didn't. This meant that those that weren't warned were wildly unprepared, becoming hotspots for the infection to spread. Some cities like Austin, Texas, where the prologue takes place, had no form of quarantine and fell on outbreak day. We can only assume that with the fungal mold originating from South America, the southern parts of North America were hit with little warning, while areas to the west and east, like Boston, had a small amount of leeway. However, even those prepared still had to take desperate measures to avoid complete collapse. The downtown area of Boston was bombed beyond recognition in the hope of wiping out the infected. We know that aggressive counters like this were taken in other cities like Seattle. For those that did manage to survive the initial years, further problems began to establish themselves within the zones. FEDRA's authoritarian approach to ruling created a heated tension between them and their residents, and as rations began to diminish, order within the zones came to a breaking point. Riots broke out, progressing to attacks, and eventually, the Fireflies were born. This militia resistance group began to rise up against FEDRA across the US, whilst also renewing hope to find a cure for CBI, something that had long been given up. In some cases, like Salt Lake City, the Fireflies were able to overcome the military ruling and push FEDRA out. However, in other areas, like Boston, Fireflies were executed and almost entirely wiped out. But the sentiment of the Fireflies came in many forms. We know that the Washington Liberation Front, or WLF, formed in Seattle under almost the exact same circumstances. Another example of this were the Hunters in Pittsburgh, who rose up against their oppressors with the help of the Fireflies, yet turned on them, developing their own hostile way of life, becoming even worse than Fedra, according to some. And there were certainly many factions that we don't know about across America, as it was around this time, just a couple of years after Outbreak Day, that any form of news, whether it be written or broadcast, faded away. Through all the fighting and revolution, most of the quarantine zones fell, and if they remained without the force of FEDRA, they never reached the same level of strength. This meant that the remaining population of America were spread out across the country, either joining groups, roaming on their own, or forming their own communities like Tommystown in Jackson County. All the while, the infected further established themselves in their once great cities. And what about Joel? We obviously saw a massive change in the character between the opening prologue and that 20 year skip to 2033. While much of his past is shrouded in mystery, we do know some details in how he became the man we know in this story. It's hinted at that Joel may have considered suicide, as we learn from his final discussion with Ellie in the conclusion to part one. I struggled for a long time with surviving. And you, no matter what, you keep finding something to fight for. For Joel, survival became that something. And the ultimate goal is he and Tommy navigated the early years of the outbreak. Joel was willing to do anything to keep him and his brother alive, and that philosophy led to the two becoming hunters. How did you know? Know what? About the ambush. I've been on both sides. Oh. 
So, uh, you kill a lot of innocent people? <sighs> I'll take that as a yes. Take it however you want. We all know how brutal Joel was, as throughout his and Ellie's journey, we saw him pick up on traps, mercilessly interrogate and torture people, and eventually massacre the majority of the Fireflies, just to keep Ellie alive. Many of the attacks Joel and Ellie became victims to were exactly the kind of thing that Joel did for the majority of those 20 years. Tricking, robbing, and murdering innocent people. Eventually, Joel and Tommy travelled up to Boston, smuggling their way into the quarantine zone. It was here that Tommy finally grew tired of Joel's murderous streak, claiming that he never wanted to see him again. It was at this time that the two had been arguing over Tommy joining the Fireflies. Eventually, Tommy left Boston for Wyoming, and it was years before the two reunited once more. However, the dark times still loomed over Tommy, who claimed all those years later that he still got nightmares from their time on the road. For all those goddamn years, I took care of us. Took care? That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me! It wasn't worth it. With Tommy gone, Joel established himself as a smuggler within the Boston QZ, along with his partner in crime, Tess. The two were never romantic, or at the very least, were never confirmed to be, but there was an undeniable yet unspoken intimacy between the two. There's enough here that you have to feel some sort of obligation to me so you get her to Tommy's. With their setup, Joel and Tess were able to get by within the QZ for years until they stumbled across a wounded Marlene, leader of the Fireflies, who had one big job for them. And that's all we have for today's episode of Push Square Deep Dive. Of course, this is a little different than our usual style of content for the channel, so let me know down below if it's something you'd like to see more of. In addition to that, I'd love to see some of your suggestions for further bits of lore you'd love to see explained, whether that be within The Last of Us or any other PlayStation exclusive. Anyway guys, I appreciate you as always for watching. Like the video if you'd like to see more, and subscribe to Push Square for more PlayStation video content. I'll see you next time.